So the month of Sha'ban is, of course, the eighth month in the lunar calendar. Um, and there's some interesting discussions about its name. The Sha'a means to branch out. So the idea is that this is a month where there is a lot of good. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the adherent believer, you know that the believer is the one whose foundation is strong. Ibn Abbas said, La ilaha illallah is the foundation of the believer. Are the good deeds that a person does. So there's some Arabologists, if you will, Arabists who say that the word Sha'ban is from this word, the Sha'a. To branch out. So, like, we take from that immediately the idea of doing like a lot of good, you know, alhamdulillah this month. Others, they said it from, from the word shi'ad. Shi'ad actually is a road in the mountain. And if you think about in ancient times, if you were in a mountain and you found a path, that's a good thing, right? Before modern urbanization, there were no roads. So, if you were in a mountain in ancient times and you found a, a, a path, that that path would like mean safety for you. You know, it would help you achieve your goal. So some scholars said, like, this is the path to Ramadan, subhanAllah. Like, this is the path to the citadel of Khay. The apex of good is the month of Ramadan. So this is like the path. So we're talking about the hadith of Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik from Imam and Sayyid Imam Ahmed a little bit later. Other ulama. They said it's from Sha'ab. Sha'ab here doesn't mean that you will understand it to me now, but in the ancient language, Sha'ab means to force something on someone, to, 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 to force them into submission. And they said that because this is the month where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa hul qahar qahara anfusana bi ta'ati. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breaks our nafs and our shahawat in this month with ibadah. So again, as our brother beautifully read, he read so well, mashallah. You know, his mom was my daughter's uh, teacher, Renata. Um, that this is the month where our nafs and our hearts are being prepared for the month of Ramadan. We have a very important principle uh, in also uh, and I hope it's not too complicated, we say, you know, that a, a given time is honored bima ya'afihi min al hawadith. That as Muslims, we recognize the importance of certain moments and times. This is an a'idah, usuliyah. It's a principle of usulfiq. Yushrafu. Tushrafu. Al-azmina. Bima wa'afiha. Min al hawadith that different times and places are honored by what happens in those times and places. So, for example, the month of Ramadan, we honor it because it's the month which the Quran was sent. We honor it because it was the month in which Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam became rahmatul alamin. And it's the month in which his ummah, this community became marhuma mahfuba hatta tukum sa'a. It became the best ummah and it became the blessed ummah and the protected ummah. All that happens in the month of Ramadan, Shah Ramadan, and Ladi Uzi Rafi al Quran. So we honor this month because of so many things that happened. And Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to honor those times and moments in which there was a lot of good. As he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa dhakirhum bi ayyamillah, remind them of the days of Allah. Meaning those days when Sayyidina Musa and the previous Anbiya, Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa udhu hatta atahum nasruna. When Allah is mentioned in the Quran, Allah helped them. This is actually a very, very important principle because it links the Ummah to its history. 
And for those who celebrate the Noahic, you know, this is like a controversial issue, but we're going to get caught up in that. But the idea of ihtifal, bil mawad, the sahihin, wa awliya, wa anbiya, is rooted in this aqida, this, this, this principle. We, when we think about the great battles that happened and when they happened, when we think about fasting Ashura, it's one of the reasons we fast, fast those days, is to remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَيْفَرْقَنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرَ فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ وَأَغْرَقَنَا آلِ فِرْعَوْنُ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Sayyidina Musa and his people from Fir'aun. So we celebrate times and places, and I need to make a very important point, not because of the time and place, that would be sure. But we celebrate different times and moments in our history because we celebrate the one who decreed that that khayr would happen in those days, and that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, after he gave him victory and he gave him fat, what did he say? فَسَبِّحْ بِمْحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ وَفَعْ تَعْقِيمِ Like after all this we did for you, and we mentioned to you the facts that we gave you, and we saw people embracing Islam in these days, because that those good things happen in these days, magnify Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to be careful. We're not celebrating the days or the people, but we're celebrating Allah Azza wa Jal, Al Qadir, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, who decreed good for us and good in those days. That's why Sayyidina Imam Al Awa, uh, Abu Hanifa, used to say, He had to say, He had to say, He had to say, He had to say that the stories of the righteous are more beloved to me than fiqh. Strange statement from one of the Mushtahid Imams, subhanAllah. They asked him why. He said, Fiha mahasin as-salihin. Because in, in that is the stories of the righteous and how Allah helped them. And we have to be careful of people within the Muslim community who try to distance us from our history in the name of Bira. Because when you take now an Ummah under so much pressure and you distance it from its great history, it's very difficult to find motivation in these days when things are so difficult. Except, subhanAllah, we have to go back to some of the great people in our history, the great occurrences of our history. When I was in the Azhar and I was studying Hadith, there was one Sheikh who was my teacher, Hadith, who was very busy. And so I came to him and I said, you know, how in these days do you find like the motivation, how do you find like, the, the qudwa, you know, the example to keep yourself motivated? And he, he was a rabbi. So he said, well, first of all, you need to be self-motivated. Don't live your motivation by kerosene through people. Because that will make you like, well, the whole is horrible, much is horrible, I give up. So he said, first, you yourself, you have to be motivated. And then he said, secondly, if you can't find any righteous people or any good people, then go read history. Read the history of the Salaf. Read the history of the Salih. Read the stories of the prophets. And you will find motivation and you will find the, the, the haqq of this ummah, you know, like the truth of this ummah across generations and generations and generations. That's why Ahmed Shawqi, in his uh, poem about the prophet, he said, he said, Isa, he caused the dead to come to life. But you, Muhammad, you brought generations to life. So we have this very important principle that links us to our history. It's a very beautiful principle that that places and times are given value based on what happens in those places. That's why the Prophet وسلم, when the Sahaba were passing by the places of Thamud, what did he tell them to her? There's no this is the place of Adab. Go quickly, go quickly. So if we take that principle and we apply it to this beautiful month of Sha'ban, subhanAllah, a lot of great stuff happened, you know. And this month, 
that should allow us to feel the motivation to prepare, mashallah, for the blessed month of Ramadan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to see this month of Ramadan. The first, that in this month, the Qibla was changed. <clears throat> and that's something very important in our history. And that was something that made the Messenger of Allah happy. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the changing of the Qibla is one of the components of the statement, وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْتِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى like don't worry now. Don't 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 get it twisted, right? Things aren't working out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you happy. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abu Hadith, one of the great scholars of Hadith, and you find others in the books of Tafasir, they mentioned that the changing of the qibla happened after the Muslims had faced Al Aqsa, Bayt al Maqdis actually. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect and free bring khair to the people of Palestine. That the Muslims, they prayed towards Jerusalem for 17 months and three days. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he kept looking to the heavens, waiting for the command. And here we take an important lesson, that in happiness and in anger and in sadness, we should be with Allah. Like sometimes if you feel pressure, we have no choice but to trust in Allah. But even in the good that I want to do, I should be patient. That's what Ibn Abba Allah says in the Hikam. You know, like if you trust in yourself, then you're going to lose faith when things don't go your way. Like when you just so even though the Prophet, and he's the Prophet, he's excited, he's, he's earnest for the direction of prayer to be changed to Mecca, he's pleased with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides. He's patient. Sometimes people make mistakes, especially in Muslims, we have a lot of energy, so we think that that zeal equals a sanction to act. No, no. It is time to be patient, to be smart, to think. So Sayyidina Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kept looking and looking and looking and looking and then Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to him, You see you. Indeed, we see you. You keep looking up. And now, we're going to direct you to a qibla that will please you. SubhanAllah, Sayyidina Aisha said, مَا أَرَى رَبُّكَ إِلَّا أَنْ يُسَارِعَ إِلَّا فِي هَوَىٰ and it only, every time I see like your relationship with Allah, Allah is rushing to do what makes you happy. So Allah al-Bukhari, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like every time you want something that's khair, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expedites it for you. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَحِيْثُ مَا كُرْنُتُمْ فَوَلْهُ وُجُوهَكُ شَطَرَ and here we learn something from the verses of the changing of the Qibla that we as a community share in prophetic responsibility also. Because here, this is in Balagha, the rhetoric called something iltifat, the tense changes. I used to hate this one on great papers in university. Now with this chat thing, it makes it more difficult to know who's writing what. But I remember people would change tenses. I don't do that, this is English. But in Arabic, it's a good thing. To change the tense, if there's a mafum, if there's an understanding in the verse that's powerful. So look, Allah says to the Prophet, Alayhi salatu salam, Then later on it says, kuntum, not The verse changes, the tense changes from speaking to the Prophet alone to speaking to all of us. Dr. Muhammad Ali Sayyid, he was the dean of the College of Sharia, Rahimahullah, in Al Azhar. He said to show us that we, as followers of the Prophet, وسلم, we share this responsibility. We have been now anointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do the work of prophecy. SubhanAllah. This happened in Sha'ban. 
And Abu Hatim, he said this happened in the middle of Sha'ban. That the direction of the Qibla changed. And this is something that brought pleasure to the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Another thing that happens in the month of Sha'ban, which is important to us, and mentioned by most of the scholars of Tafsir and the scholars of Hadith, is that the verses that command us to send salawat to Sayyidina Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, were sent in Sha'ban. The verses of Surah Ahzab. Wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah wa malaikatam yusalluna ala nabi Ya ayuha al-lazina amal Sallu alayhi wa sallimu tasleema Allahumma salli wa sallim alayhi That verse says, Indeed Allah and his angels They send peace and blessings upon the Prophet O oh, believers, you must This is a command You must send salawat upon the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam. Abu Sayyid al-Yamani from the Salaf, he said, Nuzilat, that this verse was sent in the month of Sha'ban. Commanding us to send salawat on Abu Sayyid al-Adam. So we can be from the people of Ahl al-Jinan. Bi rahmati rabbi al-Rahman subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the month of Sha'ban, this command, which is nothing but good for us. Whoever wants to find khair should send abundant salawat upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I remember when we were memorizing Al Bukhari, we complained to our teachers and we can't memorize Bukhari. He said, Because you're not making salawat upon the one that's in Bukhari. That's why I said to Imam al he said, Whoever reads hadith from the people of hadith, whenever they read the name of Muhammad, they should say loudly, not in a way that disturbs people, Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. That's why they call Ahl al Because they always make a salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And as my friends in Egypt used to say, if you want to be happy, sallu ala nabi. If you want to be happy, say salawat upon Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet said, Man salla alayya sallallahu alayhi ashara. Because we have to understand the Prophet doesn't need our salawat. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need our salawat. But as Al Mullah al Qari said, when you send salawat, Wallahi, you are spending on yourself. You are being generous with yourself. That's why the hadith of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Muslim, radiallahu anhu, from Imam al Tirmidhi, the Prophet وسلم, said that the miser. The, the stingy person is the one who my name is mentioned and they don't say salawat on them. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in the month of Sha'ban, the Qibla was changed to Mecca, Muharrama, Haram. And also this verse, some said it was said in the night of Isra Mi'raj, but it's not a strong opinion. The strong opinion is that the verse to send salawat to Mount Sayyidina Rasulullah, Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Was sent in the month of Sha'ban. Imam Ibn Qayyim and his book Jalal al Afam, the Salat, Salat, Salat ala Khair al Alam, this great book that he wrote about sin of peace and blessings of the Prophet, he mentioned the 81, alayhi salam, 81 virtues of sin and salawat upon Sayyidina Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The Yuhrija Kumil Gurumati, Ilaymu, Alhamdulillah. So sometimes, you should tell young people, make salawat. It's hard. It's hard. not hard to make TikTok. Make salawat. It's hard. You see, also older people too. The algorithm is the job. So you want to make sure, especially in this month, but you remember that this is the month, mashallah, where this command came for us to send salawat upon the Prophet. Some of our scholars used to call salawat upon Sayyidina Rasul Safim in the chat. I mean, the ship that will take you across the ocean of doom to salvation. That's why the Prophet said, Nobody sends salawat upon me except this present, presented to me. And I respond to them. That's a good hadith. And the Prophet said, Whoever sends salawat upon me on Friday, it is presented to me. And the name of that person is mentioned. And I respond and say the name of that person. 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we see now this month, khalas, if that was all that happened, so we need to know. Because a to sharraf al makar or al amkina wa azmina bima waqa'at fiha min al hawaii said that as Muslims, we give value to things based on what happened in those places or times. Because that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifested his asma and sifat and rahmah to creation. We should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. The other thing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith related by Sayyidina Imam al nasai he mentioned that in the, in the month of Sha'aman, Turfa'u al amal that the actions are raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What it means is that our actions are accepted. There's four different times that this happens in a year. But alhamdulillah, this is one of those times. And that's to show that those times are blessed, like the month of Ramadan, for example, later to Jum'ah, for example, and others. But specifically, the Prophet sallallahu said that in this month, in this hadith is good. Our deeds are accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why I say that Anas ibn Malik, he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we'll note in the hadith of Sayyidina Aisha from al Bukhari, hadith of Sayyidina Anas ibn Ibn Majah, it's a good hadith. That he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I don't see you fasting in any month besides Ramadan more than the month of Sha'ban. And he said, because this is the month, Yafuru al Nasu. Baina Rajab and Ramadan, people that negligent our Kamaqat between the month of Rajab and Ramadan, people get lazy. And it's in this month that the deeds are raised. So I want to be fasting when my deeds are being audited. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa anasai. He said, Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So that's the third amazing reason that we should honor. And celebrate, alhamdulillah, this blessed month, subhanAllah. The fourth, that after all of the months out of Ramadan, this is the month that the Prophet sallam, fasted the most. The authentic narration of Umila Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, al mubarra fi kitabillah, who said that sometimes it was though he fasted Sha'ban kulla. Like, I thought he fasted the whole month. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In other narrations, uh, from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he said, you know, very rarely we saw he wasn't fasting in the month of Sha'ban. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there are numerous narrations, some of them are not strong, but they're strengthened by other narrations. Uh, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he encouraged us to fast. And that's why I say that Aisha, when she was asked, she said, I, I did not see him fasting more outside of the month of Ramadan, from this month of Sha'ban. So that's the fourth reason, mashallah, we should be excited and motivated. Number one was, we said the changing of the qibla or the third reason. Number two, we said, was salawat. The verse is to send salawat. Number three, yeah, was the actions are raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of four different situations. And now, the fourth, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he used to fast abundantly in this month. Alayhi salatu wa sallam. Maybe somebody's saying, but what about the hadith that says, after the middle of Sha'anat, don't fast. It's not for somebody who regularly fasts. And also, this is not a command, it's tahrim. Doesn't mean you're forbidden to, it's just better if you don't. But if somebody has days to make up for the month of Ramadan, is somebody regular fast, or somebody wants to have qurba, min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go for it. Alhamdulillah. Because the Prophet sallallahu said to the Sahaba, alaykum bi sawm fi inna ula adala. Like so, fasting has no comparison, there's nothing like it. There's no equal to it. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The fifth is also because this is the in this month is the night where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees who is going to die. 
in the next year. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bil afiyah. And from the authentic narration of Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, who said, also very similar to the previous narration, related by also Ibn Majah and Ahmed and the Muslim, I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like, why are you fasting so much this month? He said, because this is a month where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees who is going to not decree because Allah's decree is asan, but it means ibraz ma qada. Allah makes clear what he decreed before creation to those malaika, and the other narration says, to matter the mote to take the souls of those people to the next year. So the Prophet said, and I hope that when my ajal, when my you know, life expectancy is presented, I'm fasting. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So here we see two of the virtues I mentioned. One is fasting, the second is that the people who will pass away, we ask Allah, Dr. Abraham, subhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa grant him highest levels of jannah. SubhanAllah. And we ask Allah to extend our life, inshaAllah. As long as as long as our life is good for us. So here we saw a number of virtues. All those hadith are good hadith or strengthened by other narrations. Some of them are from Bukhari, specifically the hadith of Sayyidah Aisha. Some of them from Imam Muslim, not from the people Taba'at. They are authentic narrations in Imam Muslim's collection. What are the five things we should think about to get into soul? Number one, the changing of the Qibla. Number two, reverse about Sidi Salawat upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number three, number three, the presentation of deeds. Number four, that the Prophet used to fast it a lot this month of Sha'ban that's coming. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam finally said, he mentioned that the list or the information or knowledge of those people who are going to die in the next year is made evident to Malik most. So those are five reasons, mashallah, that we should honor this month. Also, if we look to some of the salaf, it's important to know that the salaf very rarely agree on things. You know, they agree on the usul. They agree on the foundations of Islam, but sometimes they differ on the practice of those foundations or the the, 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 the spirit of how they were implemented. Or sometimes they may have differed as Mishmashayah, they differ because some of them knew things that others didn't know. Some of them had narrations that others didn't know. Actually, now in this era, you have more access to hadith than they did. But they had greater fit than we do. SubhanAllah. Now there's an app, it's on the phone, that has all the major books of hadith. Just put in the Arabic word, it comes up, it gives you the sun, it gives you the names, it gives you the status of the hadith. Even now there's an app with all of the masakif and all of the different qira'at. There's another app now, they're all free. All the tafasir. SubhanAllah, we have more information, you know, but unfortunately because we may not know how to process that information, it leads to differences instead of unity. That's the difference. But specifically, if we look at the early generations of Muslims, we found some disagreement about specifically honoring the what we call Shabi Barat or the, the middle of the night of Shabbat, Nus Shabbat. There are numerous narrations of the Prophet about this night, but as as Al Haf of Ibn Rajab he mentions. Most of these narrations are not free of some kind of criticism. However, Sheikh Al Umari and others said if you bring many of them together, you support one another, especially if you find like if you see the early Muslims acting on those hadith. That's why we, the Madikis, you know, we, we have an axiom right? that the actions of the Salaf sometimes are stronger than narrations. Stronger than hadith that are narrated because they're acting in. It's impossible for us to believe they will act 
in contradiction of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, for example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is reported to have said that some of these hadith are not extremely weak, by the way. Hadith of Sayyidina Anas, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala on the night of the night of Sha'bat, he will say, like, who is there seeking forgiveness? I forgive them. Who is seeking to defeat a hardship? I will remove their hardship. Who is asking for risk? I'll give them their provisions. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hadith of Sayyidina Aisha. There's numerous ahadith that talk about this middle night of Sha'ban. I don't know why we're fighting over this, by the way. Subhanallah. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. Subhanallah. It's not a problem. But we find some of the early Muslims. They differ over this practice. So, for example, Khalid ibn Ma'dan was from Ahl Sham, from the Salaf. Madhud was from the Salaf. Uh, Luqman ibn Amr was from the early Muslims. I don't know these people, but some students of knowledge, they're going to want to go and you know, do research is good. These people are from those people we call As Salaf. As Salaf of Saleh. And those people, the Imam ibn Rajim al Hanbali, Sheikh ibn Taymiyyah, and others, they mentioned that those people in the middle of the night of Sha'ban, they used to wear nice clothing and they used to worship and engage in ibadah and so on and so forth. And in fact, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah says, وَهَذَا لَا يُنْكَرُ عَلِيهِ This is not anything that anyone should make in car of. Like, no one should rebuke this. It's established because those people are from Salaf al I mean, to say a Salaf doesn't give me the right to choose what Salaf I want to follow. It doesn't say the other Salaf I don't follow. No, if you follow one salaf in an ishtihad, and other salaf they have a different ishtihad, then all of that is from a salaf of salih. A myopic view and a myopic implementation, it's not correct. If I took me on the bi-ba'di as-salafina, or if I took me on the you believe in some of them, some of them you don't believe in it. And we see all groups do this, unfortunately. But we should, we should acknowledge the richness of our tradition, we should acknowledge the the layers. Minor A B thing. We gotta you gotta use this mic because that mic's muted. Okay, yeah, yeah. so I'm just kidding. So I'm just this okay. Understand. Okay, but I think that mic they can hear better. So what? I think they can hear better with that mic. You think so? You can ask. Them. Can you hear? Oh, well, yeah. I have to figure it out. <laughs> so I think that mic is, is better. No way, bro. Try that, try that, see what happens. Can you hear me now, or do you hear me? You gotta bring this to your face. You're not even trying, you're not even trying. Shame. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is the live stream is like. What are you doing both of you? I'm leaving both of you. I guess I could do that, but like. <laughs> you know, this is gonna be crazy. But the live stream can't hear this one. Probably. Can they hear this one? Yeah. So you wanna do both? I mean, then people will die. That'll be a problem. Because I'm able to hear both my Oh, see what I'm saying? So I, mean, like, I don't know, whatever you guys want to do. I think if you could just hold that, you know how to use the stand, you could... Okay, yeah. maybe that's good. All right, thank okay, you. Okay, thanks, yeah. I got you, bro. I don't know what you were about to do. Try to make both work. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, man. Thank you. Still need that thing for the marriage. <laughs> I got him married. <laughs> By the will of Allah. Remember the, the axiom. You should celebrate times and places <laughs> by the events that happen. <laughs> so, in that moment, so there were a number of Salaf Salih in Syria, specifically in the areas of Damascus, who they would honor this middle night based on those hadith. And based on the actions of their teachers, so if yeah, later this is Shaban. And that's why Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah says, like, nobody can rebuke that, nobody can reject that, nobody can deny it. And that's why the form of Ahab in general, if you look at the form of Ahab in Sunni law, they say it's good to worship on this night. There were other great scholars, we have to. Be balanced though, because maybe some people aren't comfortable. It's okay. Like said, Imam Malik Imam Hadis, his madhab differs with him. He said, Hadi he bid'ah. And in fact, Ahlul Medina, most of the fuqaha of Medina, uh, Muhammad al and others, said, Hadi he bid'ah. 
This is innovation. Perhaps they said it was an innovation because those riwayats, those narrations, and those practices of those Sahaba who went to different places didn't reach them. This is something very common in the early formulations of Islamic law. That some scholars had access to narrations and others did. And that's why Hajj, Hajj used to be very important to the ulama. Like now, even when we make Umar or Hajj, we go and read to some of the Mashaykh, because that's the time we get to see them. Also, Imam al Ozai, Imam al Hashem, Imam al Ozai had his own madhab. His madhab was the madhab of Andalus before Yahya went to Andalus, Malik al Sahir. With Imam Malik's madhab, the people of Andalus used to follow the madhab of Imam al Ozai. Rahimahullah. He also didn't accept this practice. The point is, the Salaf, you don't find like a agreement on to do it or not. And they all have their evidences or lack thereof. What you should think about in this night, though, is the following. It's better not to do it in Jama'ah. Because doing it in Jama'ah may that may formalize it in a way that it wasn't formalized by the Prophet, so the Bible's burdens. Number two is, some scholars said it's better to do it in your house. Why? Because that's closer to ikhlas. That's closer to sincerity, to be alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also the Prophet said, لَا تَجَعْلُ You know, don't make your houses like um, a graveyard. So, to bring life to our homes with worship. The third issue on this is we should not fight at all. That, everyone agrees, is not allowed. One time, Sheikh even taking it, some people sent him, Rahimahullah, a message. They said, in this message, we are arguing about the sifat of Allah. Does it sound familiar? Why can't people agree on the sifat? If we agree on the sifat of Allah more than we argue on the sifat of Allah, the world would be a different place. Subhanallah. So they said they wrote him a letter. And they said, like, you know, we started to get into a fist fight in the masjid. So we started to throw, like now what we call shiv shiv. Started to throw the, sh the shoes at each other. And so then, Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, among those who follow Ibn Taymiyyah, who think they follow Ibn Taymiyyah, so listen to what he wrote back to them. You know what he said in his letter? Why are you fighting? Then he wrote a whole essay about why you shouldn't fight about this kind of stuff. We set up a Ulfa. It's published. Sheikh Abu Fatah Abu Ghuddah, Rahimahullah. He did a nice, like, you know, critical uh, edit of that and published it. So he said, like, why are you fighting over these issues? Oftentimes, you know, we fight over religious issues because we have some trauma in ourselves. And that's how we show our trauma. Maybe it's childhood trauma. Maybe it's religious trauma. Why is it so difficult just to say, okay, lakum ishtihadukum, waliyah ishtihadukum. And that's why it's not reported that any of the salaf fought on this issue. Even though they differed. It was a strictly academic discussion. And that's why Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah, that the brilliance of Imam Shaykh, when he said, Inna Masai, and Ishi Hariya, that's what covered it. In the Risala, he said, You know, these kind of issues where you can legitimately differ, nobody should raise their hand to someone else. Why? Because the only time you're able to, like, physically do something is when it's a what? Munka. Allah Amin Kum Munkaran, Fali Waikhu. Being Ishi Hari is not Munka. Ishi Hari is Ishi Hari. Sayyidina Muhammad said, if you see a munkar, if you see evil, change it with your hand. So the language of Imam Shafi is very delicate and precise. He said that these kind of issues where there's legitimate differences amongst the early Muslims, nobody should raise their hands. Meaning no one should try to physically like, get involved because it's not munkar. And most of the time what we see in communities are people fighting over issues of ishtihad and they differ over issues of usul. SubhanAllah. They differ over the foundations, they fight over the issues that you're not supposed to fight over. And that's why sometimes we find issues and problems. 
So be careful of people who try to inflame. It's okay to academically say, I don't agree with this, I don't follow that practice, or I do follow that practice. No problem, alhamdulillah. That's an academic discussion. We can have that discussion. But if you find someone saying, this community is evil because they don't do it, this imam is a shaitan, that the child, because he doesn't, blah, 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 blah. These people are agents of shaitan. And they are dividing our community and weakening us. Those early Muslims that we discussed earlier, there's a very beautiful historical narrative associated with the month of Sha'ban. In fact, Imam al he said there are 23 names that the Salaf and some of the early Muslims gave to this month. The first, subhanAllah, is the month of takfir, not that takfir. <laughs> the month of forgiveness. Because of the narrations about the actions being presented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the narrations about there being forgiveness in this month, they call it the month of forgiveness. Others, they call it the month of the Quran. In fact, it's narrated on behalf of Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik, and this Islam has a little bit of weakness in it. He said that when the month of Sha'ban would come, that the Sahaba would become busy reciting the Quran. In the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Rajab is Shahullah, Sha'ban Shahi, Ramadan Shahu Umati. Alayhi salatu salam. This hadith is strengthened by the number of narrations when brought together because Hassan the lady. That the month of Rajab is the month of God. The month of Sha'ban is my month because it's the month of the Quran for reciting the Quran. The month of Ramadan is the month of my Ummah because Alhamdulillah we're forgiven and so much mafirah and being protected and safe from hellfire this month. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَإِنَّهُ لِي وَأَنَا أَزِبِي Our word for it. Others, they call this the month of Ihya. Specifically the night in the middle of Sha'ban. Because some of the Salaf, they said that the angels have two Eids. This is sound narration. That the angels, they have two nights that are Eid for them, like our Eid in the daytime. The first is the middle of Sha'ban. The second is the Lay of the why is it eat for them? Because people are patient, ibadah, khair, charity, sadaqah, and so many other things. Another name, mashallah, uh, given to this blessed month is the month where things are uh, distributed. Of course, those of you who read Surah Al Duhar, you know, some ulama said that that Surah Al Duhar is talking about that night. In the middle of Sha'ban, where all of our provisions are made clear to those malaika and everything that will happen, alhamdulillah. What is it that we should be doing in this month as we prepare for the month of Ramadan? Number one, what you just did is to learn some new things about this month. One of the worst things anybody can say is, I never heard that before. Are you a Samuel Ali? You know, I never heard that before. So, how if our kids said that to us? Clean your room. I've heard that before. We'll, we'll lose our minds, man. <laughs> but I never heard that before. Should be instead, <laughs> We should say what Musa said. Ali Salam, can you teach me something I don't know? But this is an age of inflated ego. It's an inflated an age of very shallow religious literacy. So people think that because they haven't heard something, that's why in Adab al you know, Malara, this, this science of how to argue and study, we have a great principle that says, Alam ma'rifa la yufi al wujud. Just because you don't know something doesn't mean it, it, it does or doesn't exist. Well, jahu la yufi al jahu. I don't know something doesn't mean. It's not known, it just means I don't know. And the job of teachers, Shaykh Iman Fuad, we're lucky enough to have it, mashallah. 
is to make you uncomfortable. That's why the great scholars, how did they die? You name one scholar, Bukhari, he died by himself. Imam Al-Tabari, his funeral could not be held outside. It was held at night in his home, Al-Tabari, the one now everybody loves him. Because they challenged with scholarly information the collective ignorance of the communities they served that can show trouble. That's why Imam Ibn Rushd al hafid when al Qari Abu Bakr al Arabi went to visit him, he said, Where is Ibn Rushd? They said, Mahmoud, he's under house arrest. Ibn Rushd? House arrest? So, yeah, he's under house arrest. Imam al Asa'i, who we mentioned tonight, when he went to Damascus, and he came to Damascus, and he saw people cursing Sayyidina Ali and cursing Sayyidina Fatima. He said, Aksha Ali him al like I'm scared they're going to go straight. I'm a big Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Fatima, Sayyidina Nisa Ahl Jannah, Sayyidina Nisa Ahl Alameen, all those hadith are sahih. So he wrote a book, Fadail Sayyidina Ali, it's published. And then the people, the Syrians don't get him, it's history, it's not you. The people there, they ask him, why you don't write the Fadail of Muawiyah? He said, he doesn't have any Fadail, and they killed him. Imam the same was killed. One narration says he was beaten and he died on the way to Mecca. So if you look at the great scholars that you, you love now, Ibn Taymiyyah, Bukhari, Abu Hanifa, Malik, Sayyidina Shafi, the strong opinion of Sayyidina Shafi, he was assaulted and he died. They were punished by the collective consensus on ignorance by the uneducated Muslim masses. Because they made them uncomfortable. That's why Subhanahu wa Taala Qadi Abu Bakr said, "I was in Andalus, and there was Imam Al Qurtusha, a Maliki. He came and he prayed like this, he prayed like this. Of course, Imam Malik is on the shoulders to pray with the hands. Then he said, I was sitting there reading in the back of the masjid, and he was praying like this. And I said, man, he's crazy. And then I saw some, you know, like workers, just workers." And they started to say, we're going to beat him and throw him in the sea. This is Imam al This is one of that great scholars of the time. So then Al-Qali Abu Bakr went to him and said, hey, don't pray like that old bro. They're going to throw you in the ocean. He said, he said they're going to kill me. Be jahli again. By their ignorance. That's why Abu Ma'ar, he said, فَلَمْ مَعَيْتُ جَهَلَ well, I said, when I saw that the masses of people were educated, I learned until they called me stupid. Because if dumb people call you stupid, it means you're what? You're educated. So most of Imam Sayyidina Imam Siyuti, at the age of 40, if you're from Egypt, where did he go? He went and lived in the Khuz, on the Nile. So many people wanted to hurt him because he said, I have a I believe I can make it she had. He tried to kill him. So he, so I want you to appreciate the fact that sometimes if you hear information from your teachers, from Shaykh, you've never heard before, that's a good thing. It's also good to ask clarifying questions. It's not wrong to challenge. We should have those discussions, but we can challenge your class. If you hear such a very Amir, great Shaykh, a great teacher in the Arabic, she wrote this great book, 345 pages and it come out. I'm sure somebody's going to say, I never read that before. My it. Like you read every book that was ever written? One time I was with one of our teachers in the Mokata, and he was reading Hadith, and one guy he said, This Hadith is Da'if. What I'm going to do, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do, sorry. Tear the Sheikh to pieces. The Sheikh, he said, Well, like, did you have a bad day? He said, Yeah, my wife and I, we had some dosha yani. I said, why, why, why are you bringing it to the Muslim? Then the Shaykh, he said, actually, this hadith, because you have to remember something, what he said is so brilliant. That of all of the handwritten texts in Muslim history, only 6% have been printed. That means, you know, the large body of the academic tradition, hasn't seen the light of day. The makhtutat. The handwritten books. So that means you and I were just reading what? A drop from the ocean. Then the sheikh said, come with me to my house. 
I have a print of a mahtuta with this hadith, I quote it with a sanad sahih. <coughs> he said, I'm sorry, Sheikh, I don't know. He said, that's where you should have started from. The problem is not only imams and scholars. The problem is also people that push them and they make them uncomfortable because they learn something new. By learning something new is good. One time I taught a course from Malay, and I quoted Imam al Anmi and some girl, she came up to said, I hate this class. She said, Man, why? She said, Because I never heard that before. I said, Did you pay to learn what you already know? Did you pay just to make your ego feel good? And that's why usually when someone reads with a different qira'ah today, I read with the Buzzi from Ibn Jum'ah. Somebody came to me and said, Brother, you made mistakes in Quran, you know, this is wrong. I said, no, you know, it isn't. Ibn Kathir, the Imam of Ahl Mecca from Bazi, you don't know it. No, no, brother, this is, you know, I never heard of the this before. Shafi says, Well, gentlemen, so be patient, you learn something new, but you should also be able to ask questions. No imam, no teacher is above being asked. That's a bad relationship. So the early Muslims, they call this the month of the Quran. And they would be busy reciting the Quran to prepare for Ramadan. Some of the early Muslims also would give their zakat in Sha'ban. Why? Because it's beautiful. Because they wanted the poor Muslims to have a good Ramadan, subhanAllah. They wanted the Muslims who needed zakat that they would have money in the month of Ramadan to buy gifts for their kids, to prepare food, so that they wouldn't feel the pressure of the month of Ramadan, even though we know the Prophet said the best time to give salah is in the month of Ramadan. Other things that they would do is say, La ilaha illallah, abundantly. The Prophet said, Allah wa qutu ala wa nabiyu la min qabri, La ilaha illallah, the best thing that I, anyone else said is La ilaha illallah. And finally, they would increase their ibadah. So that they were not negligent from Rajab, what they did from fasting and ibadah and khayr. And also, they would be ready for the month of Ramadan. And that's why you find like Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He would encourage people when he wrote one time to his soldiers, there are four nights where you should focus on dua. He said the first is, is later to Jum'ah. The second is the middle of Sha'ban. The second is the night of Al-Ha and Fitri. And Abdul ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, radiallahu anhu, he wrote the same thing to some people. And he added to it the new Raja, five nights he said. So the last is to make a lot of dua. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prepare us for the month of Ramadan. And the sha'ad is, is this, oh sha'ad is this path to go up the mountain. Sha'ban. So now we're preparing this ascent into the month of taqwa, the month of the Quran, the month of Nabuwa, the month of Khayr, the month of Jannah. Some of us in this room, inshallah, Allah will save us from hell in the month of Ramadan. So we should start to prepare for it. So, as I finish, what do we talk about? Alhamdulillah, we talk about like different nice names around why it's called Sha'aban. SubhanAllah. Uh, the second thing we talked about is this important principle in the Usul of the Tushar al Amkina wal Azmina, Nima Waqa'a Fiha. This is very important to tie us to our history. Because our history now, especially in a post-colonial world, and the continued military aggression and economic terrorism. I mean, it's such a hypocritical thing that they're crying about Ukraine. They can't say anything about Palestine or Israel. It's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. SubhanAllah. So we have to, in this time, Go back sometimes to great victories in history to maintain our faith and our strength and our belief in our ummah and to have the zeal and the connection to the haq. And then we talked about some of the important things that happened in Sha'ban. Changing of the Qibla, the verses of Sayyidina Salawat upon the Prophet, 
sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, sallam, actions are raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The livelihood of people or their lifespan of people who will die has been shown to by the promoter this month. And then also, uh, we mentioned, uh, you know, our aqtar and other things are made clear in this month. Those are sufficient reasons to celebrate, alhamdulillah, this month. And how do we celebrate? With the ibadah, zikr, du'a, sadaqah, working on our marriages. We're going to be married on the greatest expression. Spending time on our children. Entrepreneurs, we need to encourage entrepreneurship in the community. How can we scale? This is the word for the, the, the Bay Area. We need to scale the only. Our services are not where they should be. We need to create revenue streams that support, mashallah, our communities in ways that will allow us to really serve. This is the time to think about that, mashallah. And then we talked about, alhamdulillah, in the middle of Sha'ban and the difference of the Salaf al Salih on observing that night, those who want to do it. Alhamdulillah, they'll be rewarded for their niyyah. Those who don't want to do it, they'll be rewarded for their niyyah. There's no need to fight and argue about it. And then we mentioned some of the things that the early Muslims did by the 23 names. We go through all 23 names. I don't remember them all, of course. That they gave to this month that we know in Arabic, Kathra to Asma, to Duru'ala, Kathra to Sharf. You know, the more something has names, the more it's honored. That's why Allah, His names are unlimited. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we mentioned, it's called the month of the Qur'an, the month of Qira'ah, actually, the month of recitation. So they would recite the Qur'an and Badr al-Iyas, the Harif of Sayyidina Anas, and other of the Salaf of Sayyidina. Uh, number two, um, that they call it the month where the, the, the night of Eid is happening, just like for the angels in the middle of Sha'ban, as well as at the end of the month of Ramadan, with uh, uh, Laylat al Third thing that we said is to engage in one day, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And the fourth, we didn't mention, is istighfar. Allah said, man lazim al istighfar. Whoever constantly makes istighfar. Allah SWT will remove away from them their anxieties and provide them with places they will never know that it could have came from. This is a good hadith from the Prophet And then finally we said to increase our ibadah and work on our mu'amalat. Because you don't want to go into Ramadan having a fight with your family, with your in-laws, as Malcolm X said, Rahim Allah, he loves our laws. <laughs> we don't want to have that happen. We want to try to make sure before we push into Ramadan that we've gone to people. People wait for Ramadan to do this, but it should be before Ramadan. Work on issues in my marriage, work with my in-laws, work maybe with my children, work with my parents if I mistreated them, try to heal those relationships. So we go into the, the month of Ramadan, alhamdulillah, in a good way. And that's why the hadith of the Prophet, which is a good hadith, that Allah SWT will forgive people in Sha'ban, except for two types of people. Specifically, he was talking about the night of the new night of Sha'ban, the mushrik and the Muslim who creates discord between people. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq wa sadaq. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from his ibad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from his ibad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from his ibad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from his Thank you so much. Yeah, that's that was sweet. So, next round of applause to Sheikh. Uh, Sheikh, the first question, um, top loaded question right now, 38 upvotes, is, and I'm not really sure it's a question as much as I think the person is looking for guidance or advice. They say, uh, I have random anxiety throughout the day. I experience it, I experience it during work, with friends, and when I'm alone. This is causing me to overthink many cases in my life. That's, and yeah, and that's the end of the day. Thank you so much. So first of all, we, we believe that anxiety is not indicative, indicative of a weak of a, of a faith. It's perhaps the worst advice I've ever heard anyone gives to life. Anxiety is oftentimes an evidence for a very caring, mature, deeply, emotional person, which is a good thing. 
However, everything should be in the balance. That's why in the four books out of the six books of Canical Hadith, you find a chapter, what would the Prophet say, alayhi salam, when he felt anxious? SubhanAllah. And there are six, actually, like six dua to say, the famous one most of us know, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hami. But hazam, Prophet said, I seek refuge in you from things that cause stress and anxiety. So first of all, because that can add layers of sort of anxiousness to a person when they feel like, oh, I'm anxious, so this means somehow I'm not a good Muslim. That has nothing to do with this, inshallah. The second thing is we need to analyze what we're feeling anxious about. And I like to give students of mine a, a, a way of thinking that has helped me a little bit, not completely because I have four kids, so I'm always anxious. <laughs> But we have to have our sphere of influence and our sphere of concern. That's how we should divide our life. Sphere of influence is like, what can I impact? Like, what can I impact realistically or with some effort? So, for example, like, you know, things in my home. I can impact how I treat people. Um, now, what happened in Turkey? In earthquakes and things, I can, I can make charitable donations, Syria. Those are things I can impact, right? So those are things that should have priority. My, my circle of concern is like, is there water on Pluto? <laughs> when is nuclear fusion going to be at Costco? <laughs> and what happens, I've seen most people, they invert that. Their circle of concern is their circle of influence. Their circle of influence is actually what they can impact. So it leads to stress and anxiety. That's why Imam Ibn Al-Ta'Allah, sorry to quote a lot of Tarabi stuff, man. But Imam Ibn Al-Ta'Allah said, <laughs> SubhanAllah. He said, you know, give yourself a break from trying to administrate outcome because the outcome is beyond my control. The outcome is from Allah. He said, because what has been done for you, being from Allah, you can't do for yourself. The third thing that I've noticed with anxiety, and this is a good thing, it shows you that people care, man is that sometimes we feel guilty because things around us are so bad. We have to appreciate the fact that corporate media, especially now, is pushing narratives that lead us to lose trust in ourselves as a collective, like as a species, and highlight or amplify the things that make us different. So we need to be careful, I talked about it in the khutbah, how much am I intaking? Like if I'm taking so much that it's becoming destabilizing, I should stop. The Quran is uh, step by step. The whole Quran was to sit once because people couldn't handle it. It was the before that. We said to be like this so you can stay strong emotionally, psychologically, intellectually. What about news? And there's a very important principle, and I'm, I'm a believer in, in orthodoxy. And the word scares people. Because oftentimes orthodoxy is not understanding correctly. But orthodoxy, Islamic orthodoxy, actually is emancipating. And it brings relief. I know that because I embraced it. And one of the major principles we have is a taqlifu bil muhab la That Allah will never burden you or hold you accountable for something beyond your circle of influence. Because one of the conditions of any obligation is what? Al-Qudra. And the Malikiyah, Shurutu Wujub. Shurutu Wujub, what makes something obligatory on me? Al-Qudra. I have the physical, mental, emotional, financial ability to do it. So if I don't have the money to pay zakat, I shouldn't be like, man, I can't pay zakat, I'm such a bad Muslim. Why? You don't have Qudra. We see this every month in Ramadan, and may Allah protect us. And it shows you how dedicated people are to Allah subhanahu wa They get sick and they can't fast what they say. I'm going to fast anyways. I, I remember there was a brother on chemotherapy. So I'm fast. I said, bro, don't fast, bro. Rahimahullah. Don't fast, don't fast. Don't fast. No, no, I feel so bad. No, Allah has removed this from you. And you can achieve your good. This is the next principle. When we are unable to do things with our intention. Wallahi, if Allah gave me the ability, I will change it. And you will be rewarded for your niyyah. That's why the statement of the early Muslims, 
niyyatul mu'min khayru min amali. That the intention of a believer is better than his or her actions. Meaning when I'm incapable, especially I have family from Syria and Iran. So I understand a lot of things happen in the Syrian now, in Lebanon. My family feels obviously they're upset because they can't they can't help. They can only help in a limited way. The Why the Quran says, fear Allah according to your ability. So I should not allow myself religiously. I have to be careful that I feel guilty about things. I do not have the ability to impact. And this is my problem with TikTok Ox and Instagram Muftis. <laughs> that they tell people what? We're such a horrible woman because what's happening on Pluto? <laughs> and then you're like, yeah, I'm such a bad Muslim, you know, Pluto, the ice, the water, and this. And so people start to feel down, but this is to Khalifa Humima, then you Khalifa Humima. You are burdening them with something Allah didn't burden them. And that's why Allah said about the Prophet, that the Prophet removed this kind of burden from me. So now I see the horrible situation in Afghanistan. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. And we see now the large number of refugees coming into this country in Virginia from Afghanistan. I met one just, just yesterday here uh, uh, in, in the Michigan. And, and people, we feel that, that burden. What's happening now in Somalia? Nobody's talking about it. Right? We feel that burden, but we shouldn't feel the burden to the point that I begin to blame I'm not a good person. I'm a bad person. No, no, I don't have the ability to make that change. But I can intend, Ya Allah, if you gave me the ability, I will make that change. That's why, again, sorry, Sahib al Hikam, Imam Ibn al Ta'ala says, Ida fataha laka wichhatin, wichhatan min ta'arufi. Allah is beautiful what he said in the hiccup. That if Allah opens a window for you to know him by showing you your inadequacies, inadequacies to do something, don't despair if you can't do it. Don't despair if you want, because Allah wants to show you you're inadequate. In the moments of inadequacy, how do we make up for it? Need. Wallahi, if I could be in Palestine, help me. I'll be there. If I could be in Kashmir, I'll be there. And being sincere in this media. That's why Imam Ahmed Muhammad, when he was in prison, and his son said to him, what can we do? He said, make a decision. You can't change it. And then finally, and I believe this is very important, as an interdisciplinary approach, and I'm sure you do that. I remember you used to do this with Dr. Kamal. You have to partner with mental health providers, therapists. You have to have intake. We opened up the Alcoholics Anonymous in Boston in the masjid. And people got mad. They told me, you're encouraging people to drink. Well, open up an Alcoholics Anonymous. But then when we started in gambling, we had a problem with chronic gambling, all that fan duel nonsense. But then after we started helping people out, and our mental health providers and local physicians began to help people with substance abuse issues, I mean, in that message, I found a brother with a heroin needle in his arm in the, in the water. In making wudu. He said, Imam, I made it for 29. Ramadan. I said, MashaAllah, you made it for 29? Keep going, man. Don't worry about it. Let's go. So you want to think about this as an interdisciplinary challenge. Because anxiety is real. America's pulse is set on hyper anxiety right now. The construction of beauty that we saw suddenly came about, about young women in this country now. The high suicide rates, the high depression rates. You gotta be strategic. And we imams, we know nothing about that stuff. We we were not professionally trained therapists. We're not professionally trained to go in those deep waters with people. We can add the religious animation, but the meat has to be cooked by that interdisciplinary partnership. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, the next question that we got. Is from the sisters on the that says, uh, so 32 of those is really popular. That says, I really made up this fast for menstruation. Seems like I have to make up 200 this fast. How should I address this? Yeah, you take the opinion of you not fast that you pay the video because of Kathra, you know, what This is where someone says, I never heard that before. Good, <laughs> good, there's something new because men. I can say in my own family, baby born, breastfeeding, baby born, 
Rest in was four years. Rest four years. So Sayyidina Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, radiallahu anhu, the authentic narration, he says that those women in that situation pay the figure. And we have what's called a famous axiom in Islamic law. Al-Mushaqqa Tajibu Taysir. I mean, hardship brings ease. Say the Shaykh said, if, if something becomes suffocating, the Sharia expands it. And from the five, what are called Mushaqqat difficulties, we learn this in Dawah Ifta, in Umid Dunya. Yeah? One of them is what? Kathra. Al Kathra. Like it's too many. It's, it's unbearable. It's, it's unbearable for a person to do. So, you read Allah Bikum. Yusra, wala yuridu So the sister, she should pay the fidya. And then, if you can get it to a number of days, then she can manage that she would actually fast and fast those days. So maybe she can say, look, I can do 60. Okay, try to get it down to 60. And then fast those 60 days. Maybe she's older. She's like, look, I can't do that. I can do 10, 50. And do what you can do. And have that meal with Allah. That's great. I'm good at that. Uh, let's see, next question. Okay, this you don't really answer this one, but it hasn't asked. It says, tips for getting married, Sheikh. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll say this. Again, that's an interdisciplinary problem. Yeah. And and there has to be like a strategy for helping people get married that's not cringy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Speed dating and all that, whatever. My brother in law actually founded Mender. No, way. Yeah, he did, man. Haroon, you know Haroon. I, I cannot help anyone. I have nothing to do with it. I'm not an advisor. I absolve myself. <laughs> He's my brother in law. That's all it is. <laughs> Don't tell me nothing about it. <laughs> but I've heard the good, and the bad, and the ugly. But I think also fathers, especially with our daughters, man, we have to push in to finding them good husbands, not forcing them. And with our sons, too, we have to push in. Because what I've seen a lot, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that sometimes we just expect someone to marry our daughter. Hans is going to show up with him frozen hands. <laughs> well, that's Elsa. He's going to show up, grab my daughter, and they're going to get married, alhamdulillah, and he's going to be like everything I ever could imagine. No, no, man, we need to be out there looking for good, mature. And also, this will help men. But you got a lot of very good men, a lot of very responsible men, but they may be like, you know, <coughs> reclusive a little bit. And, and so if we are actively talking with people and not, not in a cringy way, but just as mothers and fathers, we step in. We don't force our kids to marry anybody. That's the problem. But we recommend with a lot of pressure. Now I'm joking, no pressure. But, but at least at least they feel you also have to be careful because you don't want them to feel like you're trying to kick them out of the house. <laughs> but just have, have a conversation with them first. Center it around the daughter or the son. Find out how best you can help them. I like to ask my daughter, this is my oldest, she knows she Shade, I said, how can I help you? I hate when you ask me that question. Why? Because I, it forces her. It's like when you come home and you say, how was, your day? How was school? Fine. Don't say that. Say what was the single most transformative moment that happened today at school? <laughs> you gotta be a lawyer, man. You gotta be a lawyer with that. My, my son told me, why you, why you ask me that? It's like, no, I gotta talk. Exactly, bro. I want you to talk. Right? So you wanna first center this around your children, who are now, of course, adults. You wanna find out, like, I know this is an awkward conversation, it may be weird, but you wanna create that relationship. You gotta push into being a parent. And we tend to push on. Sorry, we're gonna hurry. We don't push in. Push in means I step in with love. I step in being deliberate. I step in being a supporter. And maybe they say, I'm not ready right now. Okay, cool. I'll be back. <laughs> but at least they know that you are there and involved. When I was in New York City and in DC, I see a lot of young Muslims and they're even in their 30s. It's not young anymore, man. They're just kind of walking around, bro. Yeah. Just walking around. They have no idea. It's like, I, you know, I'm just making do uh, somewhat you know, fasting, you know, looking you know, somewhat you know, emaciated, hoping that someone will find me. And that's very sad. But as, as parents, we need to think about pushing in with love. So that, that's, that's, that's an excellent perspective because, like, it's implied for most folks that when questions like that is asked, that the, the, the onus is on 
a single person, you know what I'm saying? Like, what can I do to sort of like sort of bridge this gap? What can I do as a single guy or a single woman trying to, try to meet people and try to bridge that? So the notion of like, you know, and said, it's kind of like a top down thing, but it's more of like a family involvement, more of like fathers and, and moms pushing for quality spouses for their children and being involved in that way. Um, that's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's a refreshing We have to appreciate that the way that marriage is set up, largely through Muslim culture, I say this respectfully. Is pre-industrial, as in like pre-industrial age that we think that we still live in the village, and and so our approach towards marriage is not really fitting the puzzle of transmodern, right. post-Hellenistic, even America. <laughs> so so long, long. we have to think about different ways of finding potential right. spouses. You almost lost in post-Hellenistic, and then and then even no word even age. Even either Rebo, even Rebo. Just go down one on one straight for about 45 minutes. He's gonna run right into it. <laughs> <Tech> Central. <laughs> next question. Um, so, the next question we have um, was related to like obligations and being, and which you have to sort of like be responsible for. It is. It's just like, yes, I was inconsistent in my prayers from age 13 to 30. I don't remember exactly which prayers I, I, I read or not. How should I address making it up? I just gave you the axiom to answer that question. You, um, you don't you know, know. Well, let them talk. <laughs> Turn the mic off. All right. Look, I'm asking the audience because it's nepotism if you answer. But you looked at me and said, I don't look at you. I look straight ahead. All right. All right. Adam, well, Adam, 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 you have a hard time, man. Adam, you have a hard time. You know, I'm sure. Adam, I live in Adam's home. We're like very, we're, we're very tight. MashaAllah. I just bought you about So, what's the axiom that we can apply that I just talked about here? Present, right, abundance. We gonna say that? Can I speak? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. That's that's. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> I gotta go. Home. So only Adam can do this with me, but I love Adam as my man. And his mother, can I tell him? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> his mother is mother's in the hospital right now. So I go out for her sister, very good sister to my family. I raised my, my, my wife, actually. So now I give her a shit back and protect her and your whole family. So, Kafala, right? Abundance. So you have so many prayers. You got to make up your not sure. 13 to 30 is a lot of prayers. So, what you want to do is do your best. What I encourage people to do is like instead of praying Tarawi, every Tarawi, every Turaka, Vajramis, 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 Vajramis. At least in that one month, you got your Vajramis. And then instead of praying Sunnah, this is a very real conversation, right? Allah al Fawat, it's like in the books of film. How do you make up for prayers you missed? And look at the beauty of this person, man. And then also, you want to make sure were you an adult at 13? Like, let's make sure when you became. Responsible. And what I mean by here is maturation and physical maturity. You mentally understood it and you physically do it. And then you do your best. I'm going to do that. Uh, next question we've got is oh, this is interesting. Um, are variations of method equivalent to different sects? If sex is frowned, the S E C T X. If sex are frowned, shouldn't different methods be as well? What's the wisdom behind why we have this divide? I just wanted to sue a so you heard one of my talks, right? Hmm? You heard one of my talks and it helped you out. You don't remember? Yes. That? Just heard the feeling. Just I remember that. I felt my feeling. You feel the answer. It's a great answer. I'm using it with my wife every time. You remember what I said? No, but I feel it. <laughs> I feel it to my bones. I feel everything. It's a great, it's a great answer you gave, man. God bless you, bro. But, um, well, the men have to different than sex because the men have to agree. What makes a sect is something that differs over fundamentals. Men have they agree on the fundamentals, they differ on secondary issues, like should you put your hands here or here or here. And those issues, we allow differences. We actually welcome those differences. I think, well, could you clarify, what's, what are the examples of something fundamental? Like, like God is one. That's why we don't marry Ahmadis. They don't believe in the process of them as the last prophet. That's a fundamental issue. Nation of the sun. God appeared in the person of Master Father Muhammad as a black man. No. Nope. But 
can I put my hands to you? Can I do shabbat and not shabbat? All that falls into issues of legitimate differences. And that's why when someone came to Imam Ahmed and said, I wrote a book called Kitab al Khilaf. He said, La, call it Kitab al Rahman. I wrote a book on the, call it the Books of Difference. He said, No, call it the Book of Mercy. The problem is that, and, and, and this is not to be, you know, uh, chastising, our intellectual tradition is extremely advanced and mature. It's extremely mature and nuanced. And after we got ransacked by the Europeans and others, we got to rebuild that. We're not caught up to that level. It's like Drake versus Nas. No, just sorry, I use an example. Or Alan Beer versus whoever's popping on Box Fun singing. There's, there's, you can't, you're not going to catch up to it. And Muslims are not patient enough to study. For example, when I went in to study Kishta, you know what I had to study for the first year? Logic. I don't study logic either. Right? Like, I want to study, man, hala, wrong, bida, sunnah. It's like, no, 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 you got to memorize the Maluma to Sunnah, the stairway. Because the stairway will take you to the where you need to be. That's why it's called the Sunnah of Sheikh Akhdari. Most people don't have patience for that. Right? They want to just tear things apart. And that's why you should ask people now. It's nothing wrong with this. You see people saying very destructive things, attacking women, attacking different groups. Ask them, man, where are you trained? I saw a sheikh on TikTok recently, the thobe and the beard saying, the Palestinians are the reason Palestine is Palestine. And nobody questioned that. Yeah. The next question was, can I even down? <laughs> right? No, I mean, when someone says something like that, it's offensive, it's problematic, puts the onus of oppression on the oppressed. It's not historically accurate. But then why would you take your deed from that? Right? So you want to be able to ask people, Amen. No disrespect. And if they get in their feelings, there you go. Right? Like, did you study this? Are you trained in fatwa? Have you have you done this? Have you done are you, you know, do you have what are your academic criteria? Now all you gotta do is wear a toe in the third toe and the turban to say study this month. And they good. The leading follow-up to that question on the same master on um, six Sikendra, my friend I just met. I got yeah. Um the follow-up to that, I think, um, if you can provide some context to this, so it's helpful to understand, okay, like the differences are like the different you know, methods are different sex, and it's not something that becomes kind of focused on your mind too much on. But pragmatically, like how should one maintain focus on the context of different methods and sex? Like, what is a mentality? Like, if someone says what you're doing isn't correct, and they really have to do they like call them humbly or have to or something, like, how should I, as a lame person, as a layman person, kind of look at my day to day kind of Deal with these sort of differences. So, so, first of all, we understand what are methods actually are laws. You should understand a medhab, as we talk about it now, the medhabs in Fiqh, not Aqidah, they're law schools. Yale, Harvard, Stanford, that makes a lot of sense. Right? So, they, they agree on foundations, they differ sometimes on secondary interpretive issues because of a lot of issues that you can. I think Sheikh Hashem Abdullah, may Allah bless him, taught a class when I hear like 20 years ago, the history of medhabs. It's a great class. Your job is not to know that. And that's the problem. Your job, we have a great axiom in Fatwa that says, This is hard for people to hear. That means the opinions of the scholars to you is like the Quran and Sunnah to the scholar. The, the, the scholar is going to the Quran and Sunnah to, to get answers for you because he or she is trained. But if you're not trained as one people, they're like, I bought the muwaka to like feel really spiritual, but it's like law. It's a law book. It's a law book. People, they go like, I ordered Bukhari from Amazon, and I'm lost in that jungle. Because Bukhari, Bukhari is like a Stephen Hawking's of his time. He's genius. He, he, Till now, people are finding things in Bukhari that he put. They're like, whoa, whoa. Like this, this is a unique, highly intelligent person who didn't write Sahih Bukhari to be like top 40. He wrote Sahih Bukhari to teach you his legal 
opinions and to attack the enemies. Right? And his arguments, not, not in a harsh way. That's why it's like saying Amin as loud as you can in prayer. Because right? he's living in Samarkand, he's in Shafi, surrounded by who? Enemies. There's a kind of, oh, now I see what Bukhari writes. Like, why do you say, Amin is rough or salt? Why do you have to go, Amin as loud as you can? Because he got all those enemies around him. So he's trying to box academically. So Bukhari is not to be read. So I think, first of all, is there should be a list of resources, like, and these are the sources of the information. That's why it's not in Swiss, right? To teach functional literacy, not dysfunctional scholarship. So you're not lost in Bukhari, you're building yourself up, because we believe one of our goals in, in the Sheikh Haram, she should be able to answer questions in Iman Fuad. We believe that we want you to be able to start to work this out for yourself. Right? So, so that's why I think people start to think, like, I have to know why am I in this college? How you, you didn't go to law school. Like, how you know that? It's hard. Yeah. It's difficult. So what you do is, your job was responsible is to ask. And if someone starts beefing with you, sorry, where you said, if someone starts arguing with you <laughs> in your space, you take them to the imam. Yeah. And you know what happens? Usually when you take them to the imam, what do they do? I gotta go, man. I'm busy, man. Because they know they're wrong. <laughs> Or are they just not that certain about it? Yeah, well, they're certain to come at you, but they're not certain about themselves, which means they're wrong. Also, I'll give a great example. When people think people are praying in the wrong direction, they'll kill it and they're just a little bit off. You have, you have 180 degrees to be wrong. What's agreed upon is that you're not allowed to touch a musaddi. That is haram. But you say, you see the self stop with shahid. And people pray wrong, their hands are you. You're not allowed to touch a person in salah. But again, so that's where the, 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 the local, the locus of the, the, the location of the imam and teachers is important. Okay, let's go ask someone else. Right. So I wanted to come to that. I'd love again, Jake, for all the wonderful answers in the content. That framing of like the, the method is law schools. Um, that's really helpful. I hadn't considered that sort of like grammar. Um, it, it gets a pretty good picture. I think that's a nice sort of comment they plug, but it's that way into like they have books in the back, but also this like the Soy Web Institute for Sacred Science and Swiss. Um it's an online resource for 400 hours. I like it. From my experience with the content, it's actually 1700 hours. 1700? Yeah, yeah. And it's organized, it's class level, what's all two level, three styles, chaos, I'm sorry. We teach each other how to each other, watch our mood, each other work right there. But I like the, fo the focus of it on like, like um, pragmatic, like, like functional knowledge as opposed to just the alternative. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I guess round of applause for the shape one last time. Give <laughs> Adam, Adam a big round of applause. <laughs> Give me some beer! Oh, you gonna take a beer? You gonna take a beer? Take a beer! I said, oh, this is my butter cut now. Okay, so, good night everyone. Again, we got free meeting classes. Thank you all for coming out to the NC. Bye bye, little kid waving at me. Bye bye. He gets the idea. Bye bye, everybody. Good night. So, how'd it go?